Hallelujah. All God is asking for is our cooperation. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Nothing shall be impossible if we believe. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Tim. Great job. You all may be seated. God bless you. Thank you, Tim. As always, great to have you back. Amen. We miss Amen. you and, and Liv. Good to have you back. Amen. God bless you. And thank you, Suzanne and Tammy, for leading us in worship. And I want to thank Suzanne and Tammy again for uh, Friday night for our uh, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. It was a powerful, powerful experience. And God wants to do this every time. And for us individually, as well as when we gather together as a group, as a body. But uh, we're living in a time where things are changing, amen? Yes. And uh, the thing that remains the same is God. And he's changing us. This isn't my message, but I just want to, sh I've just been thinking about this, and I, the Lord is speaking to me uh, during the worship, too. You know, uh, In the beginning, God found that there was uh, evil in Satan. And he cast him out. The scripture talks about in a couple of places where he cast him out of heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. And cast him down to the earth. And Satan. I believe, ruled this earth during the time of, you can think I'm nuts or whatever you want to do, that's your business, but uh, during the time of the dinosaurs, during the time of Neanderthal, the, uh, what we call the cavemen and so on and so forth. And his evil brought destruction. And the earth was destroyed. And there was chaos and confusion. And God looked on the earth. God looked on this, on this confusion, on all this mess. And he began to speak his plan into this earth. And he created everything, and then he creates man. And I believe that he created man for a purpose. And the purpose was to deal with the evil that was on this earth. Satan was still here. That's why he's called the God of this world. Mm -hmm. And he's still here. And he's still the God of this world. That's why God tells us we're not of this world. You know, he breathed his life, his spirit, into Adam. Why? So that Adam could work against the evil that was here. So that man would be the, the thing to fight against it, the thing to bring. Because God was not going to come and do this. He had to have us do this. But it had to be by the spirit because it was against the spirit. And Adam failed. He gave in to the evil and was deceived. And so God knew. He knew man was going to fail. He knew it was going to happen. And he knew eventually he himself would have to come as a man to defeat this. But he keeps trying to put it into the hands of mankind to do this. And he tried to use the law and he tried to use various other things. But eventually Jesus comes, the second Adam. And we know he defeated these principalities and powers made a show of it openly, mocked him and ridiculed him before all of his angelic beings, the fallen angels, as well as all of heaven, all of the spirit realm, period. And what did Jesus do? He offered us his spirit. He went back to the spirit realm and offered us his spirit yes. for the same purpose that he gave it to Adam initially. And that is for us to put his enemy under his feet. Yeah. The world, I'm telling you, church, we thought there are parts of Pentecost and other organizations that thought that the world, the way we separate ourselves from the world is by just dressing different and getting rid of some things. Mm -hmm. The way we defeat the world is by dying to ourselves. Yes, Paul said he learned... He learned something, and that was, I was crucified with Christ. 
I live, and yet it's not I that live, but Christ lives in me. Yes. How do you do that? How does Christ live in us? By us dying to ourselves. I'm telling you, God's been dealing with me for weeks now about him wanting to dominate our lives. Us to be so aware of him that we lose consciousness or lose track of ourselves. And the reason for that is because of the evil in this world. He said, you're not of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. And that's why the world hates you. They hated me, and they're going to hate you. Because the world is, look, I'm just saying, they're demonically inspired. They're controlled and manipulated and ruled by the devil. He's the god of this world. I'm not saying we should hate them. We should hate the world and the system and the way that it operates. How does it operate? It operates by selfishness. By it being about me and what I want instead of what God wants and how God wants to work through us. And that's the reason why he's impressing us so much here in these last days about being conscious of his presence. Because the more we're conscious of him, the less we're conscious of ourselves, the less we focus on ourselves. Because the world can only attract our flesh, ourselves. It can't affect this Jesus that's in us. It can't affect the God that's in us. And so the enemy has to get us focused on ourself, right? Selfishness is why we don't forgive. It's why we don't reach out to others. It's why we don't love. It's because we are selfish. Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm just saying. I'm not accusing. I know me. And if I'm not in the spirit, if I'm not operating by the spirit, I'm as selfish as you can be. I'm only thinking about me. I'm easily offended. I get angry. I get frustrated. I get upset with people. Why? Because I want things my way. Right? Even when I want to be a good guy, I'm still thinking about me. And I'm telling you, we're living in a time where God is going to rise up in us. How is he going to be revealed? He's going to have to be revealed in us. And, I, and, and you know, we talk about the, the mark of the beast. And destroying the, the, how about the beast that's in us? The selfishness of us that has to be dealt with. We're not going to make friends with the world, church. We're going to have to bring people out of the world into the kingdom of God. Because the people of the world hate us. And if you don't think that's the case, then you just go try preaching Jesus everywhere you go. And find out what kind of reaction you get. I'm not saying we don't we don't not are not to share the Lord. I'm just saying you're not going to get a big hug from everybody for doing it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be trying to shut down churches all over this country and trying to manipulate the people that go there into thinking that it's this is just a religious function. It's not it's not even as necessary as as Walmart. Because Walmart was still open when they were shutting down churches. That's the world. The world has no respect for God or the people of God. That's why Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Amen. Now, Jesus didn't turn away from the people of the world. He tried to bring them out of the world and into the kingdom of light, out of darkness into light. That's where we're here for. Tim said it many times. Why? Why, are we, why were we born here now? For a time such as this. A people that would be willing to sacrifice themselves yes. for God. Yes. We're supposed to be Christ-like. What was Christ like? He gave up himself. Right? He gave his life. So that the world, so the world would have light. He died to himself. He died to his flesh. He died to the human part of him, so that the God part of him could live. And that's what Paul was talking about when he said, "I was crucified with Christ, and I live." Yet it's not me that lives now, because if I was crucified with Christ, what lives now, what's supposed to be living now is the Jesus that's in me. I 
I just ask you to meditate on that. Pray about that. I just, I'm telling you, God wants to be more real to us than this. And the only way that can happen is when I, you know, we think about John the Baptist. He hadn't even got to this place yet, but he already understood it. He said, I've got to become less for him to become more. He wasn't talking about making Jesus taller or bigger or more powerful. He was talking about in him. I've got to decrease so that he can increase in me. The world doesn't need a really good Nathan. The world needs more Jesus. So I can be as good as I want to be. And there's a lot of good people, good people naturally speaking, in the world. But they're still in an evil system. They're still part of a fallen world. A world that is dominated. And if you don't believe me, just, I mean, come on, what planet are you on? Look around. It's like hell on earth. Why? Because Satan is the god of this world. And unless the church stands up the way Jesus stood up against it, we're stuck with this. This is what we're going to have. This is what our children and our grandchildren are going to inherit if the Lord turns. We were left here to be the body of Christ. That's not to be a religion. That's not to be just better people. That's to function as Christ in this world. And I'm telling you, what Suzanne is talking about, the signs, the wonders, the miracles, how does that happen? It doesn't happen through flesh. It doesn't happen through ourself. It happens through the Jesus that's in us. And the only way for that to happen is for us to yield to it. That's what happened in that first century church. And that's why we haven't really seen it since in a consistent way. Because within 100 years of that first church, it was already getting distorted and perverted into a religious function and the individual was it wasn't really about people being Christ like it was about people following a religious uh, rituals and rules and regulations no different than the churches that say we need to be separated from the world come out from among them and be separate okay then dress weird look strange you know that's not that's not what he's talking about we're in this world we're just not of this world, and we're supposed to be influencing this world from where we come from, which is heaven, which is the spirit realm. That's how Satan is, de is defeated. He'll never be defeated by us just having more churches and more people going to church because there's as much devil in the churches as there is in the rest of this world. It's just a question of who's going to submit to God and who's going to submit to the enemy or to the world system. We've embraced it. I mean, let's face it. So, praise the Lord. <laughs> if you give God some time, he's going to mess your world up. He's got a plan. And it's not the plan we thought it was plan for us to die and for him to live. I'm talking about the self. Because I promise you, the less the, the world sees of us, the more they're going to see of Jesus. And it's not easy. It's painful. It hurts to die. Ask Jesus. But he said it was worth it in order for him to be able to send back the Holy Spirit so that all of us could be filled with the Spirit and not with ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's how God's going to rule and reign. That's how God's going to change this world. Praise the Lord. That, again, that's not my message, but I just can't, I, I cannot get away from this. this is, God is trying to get us to be so much more focused on him. That doesn't mean we give up loving people and our families and all, all that. It just means that it needs to come from a different perspective. He's got to be more real to us than we are. Amen. The things that we look at, they're temporal. This is temporary. Yes. And it's 
getting more temporary every day just by my aging process. But the God that's in me, the spirit man that's in me, is eternal. And that's what he's trying to get us to understand. That needs to be our focus if we're going to have any impact, if we're going to have the effect that God wants to have in this world. And that hurts. That means i got to do stuff I don't really want to do. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak, right? My spirit wants to be in total agreement with God, but my flesh says, no, I don't want to do that. It's, it's embarrassing. It, 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 it humiliates me. It humbles me. It, it makes me feel less me. Whoa. Guess what? That's what it's supposed to do. Jesus thought it's not wrong for him to be equal with God, and yet he humbled himself and became a man. He's looking for some humility. For more of God and less of us. Demanding our rights. I'm not treating politically here. I'm talking spiritually and, you know, as a person. Well, I have a right to this. I have a right to that, you know. I deserve respect. I deserve. You know, we don't deserve anything. He gave up everything. He gave up. Every, he was humiliated. He gave up every bit of respect, and he should have been all, all in awe of him. They, the world should have been in awe of him, but they didn't. They hated him. They put him to death. But they didn't put him to death. He put himself to death. He said, "No man takes my life. I'm giving it." That's right. And that's what he's asking of us. If we're going to be Christians, we're going to have to learn to do some things differently than we've done them in the past. Or we're going to get the same results. God wants to move in a powerful, mighty way, but he's going to do it through himself, not through flesh. He just has to have a vehicle, and that's all this flesh is for, to give him legal right here. So where the spirit inside of us is God. My flesh isn't going to do anything spectacular. The only time anything spectacular is going to come out of me is when my flesh dies and God is left to do what he alone can do. That's, uh, I don't know, praise the Lord. Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. This is about God being everything, all in all. Mm -hmm. And the more that we see of God being revealed in this world, the less we're going to see of us as Christians, as people, naturally speaking. And I'm confused. i got to tell you. I, I, I'm, try, I, I'm up every morning, Sally, I'll tell you, 3, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm, I'm, and, and I know God's talking to me, but my mind is so carnal. As much as I want it, I, I have trouble deciphering what it is he's saying. Now, here's the deal. Grace will reveal it. I'll know eventually. I'm going to know if I just don't quit. I'll know because that's what grace is for. Grace is not just for me to get away with stuff, although it doesn't allow me to get away with stuff. That's not what it's for. Grace is for me in order to understand what God is really trying to do in my life. It's to release his abilities in us and for me to comprehend what it is he's saying and doing. Grace is for me to keep faithing when I don't have any natural reason to keep believing or to keep having faith. Grace is to keep me until the next faith rises up. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> and yes, grace covers everything. I screw up, we all screw up. We know it from history. We see it with Abraham. We see it with David. We see it over and over and over. These people that are just such bums, such losers when it comes to the natural. But how does God describe them in Hebrews 11? He describes them by the Spirit. By faith they did this. What does that mean? It means God did it through them. because Simply because they believed, God did it. 
Not through their faith, not through their flesh, but through their yielding to the Spirit of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, anyway, I'll, God will give me this at some point where I can make sense of it. More than just frustrate me and you and everybody else listening. But I'm telling you, we need to be ready for something different. Oh, yes, yes. Because what we've been doing... I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's evil. I'm just saying we're missing the mark. We've, we've misunderstood a lot of what it is God's trying to do in us and through us. And now we've got to the place where we can't, we can't afford that anymore. Because the devil has poured himself out as he knows his time is short. He's already had a woman. And he knows he's in for another one. If we ever figure out what Jesus did for us. And that we are to replicate him. And in order to do that, the number one thing he did was to die. Die to himself. Right? Without fear. And I, again, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about going out and blowing our brains out so that God can be glorified. I'm talking about us giving up our sense of getting what we deserve. God help us if we ever get that. But giving what he deserves. So praise the Lord. I'm going to move on because otherwise I'll just keep rambling here. But I, I, I promise you, God's got something here that he's trying to reveal to me. And if he is, he'll be re I'm sure he's trying to reveal this to all of us. It isn't just me. I just happen to have the microphone right now. So we'll all come into this just like we have any other revelation of God. But that's what this is all about. It's revelation of God. And that Revelation being revealed through us to people that are in the darkness. The light's got to shine, and it's got to shine from somebody. Otherwise, it's just dark everywhere except where I am. Now, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to move on, and I want to. I'm going to. This is very simple. I don't have a complicated, deep theological message. I and I, I never have that I'm aware of. Jesus, Jesus. I just want to, I'm going to, this is a very simple message, but I just want us to look at it in a little bit different way. And it's Luke chapter 15. We're all familiar with the prodigal son. And I want to read verses 25 through 31. And here's what I'm saying. I hear this all the time. And I, I, I suppose I, I even say it to myself. Maybe that's why I'm hearing it, because I, I'm aware of it for me. We'll say, I did this, you know, I did that. But I'm seeing other people being used of God. Or I'm seeing other people being blessed. But it's not happening for me. Right? We can all say that. I mean, we, we, we've seen people over the years that work miracles and sing signs and wonders. And I've, I've seen a little bit of it in my life, but very inconsistent. I talked about it a, a, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, you know, I, I would fast. This is Fast, Sally. I fast until until I was literally pass out. Uh, there was a young man in our church uh, in his mid twenties, I suppose, married with a little child, and uh, great guy, and he had cancer, and I was convinced to pray for him, so I fasted. And I don't even remember how long the fast was, but I know it was long enough that while I was standing outside of his hospital room, I passed out in the hallway and had to have Sally come get me. I prayed for him, but I had to have Sally come get me to take me home because I couldn't drive. I, I was just out of it. And that was just one time. But it was all about me trying to do enough for God to use me. And I'll tell you another little experience I had. My pastor was out of town, and I was an assistant to the pastor. I wasn't an assistant pastor. I was just an assistant to him. And I'd only been filled with the Holy Ghost for a year or two. I did everything. I would do anything and everything because I told the Lord when, when I wanted this. I wanted him. And I, whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to do it. I, did, I mowed the yards. I changed the sign. I, and I'm not saying this to brag on myself. I was desperate. I wanted God. And I was going to do whatever I had to do to do that. But anyway, he, he, had, he was out of town. And there was an, another young man in the church who unknowingly had diabetes. He didn't know he had diabetes, 
but he had went into a diabetic coma and they took him to the hospital. And he was at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, it was a Catholic hospital in Beaumont, Texas. And he calls the church, my pastor did, and told the secretary to tell me to go pray for this kid. And I was, I, I, scared was not the word. I didn't know what to do. I was totally, I mean, I barely saved myself. And I was just freaked out. So I took the church van and I drove, we, we, the church was in Viders, right there on I-10, like you're going to New Orleans. And I drove, it was like 12 miles or something, just across the Sabine River back into Beaumont. So I take the church van and I drive over to St. Elizabeth's Hospital. I go in and I'm just freaking out. And all the way over there, I'm praying in tongues because I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. The family's all over there. And I'm thinking, you know, he's in a coma. Why, you, they're looking at me. I, how am I going to do anything for him? I don't know what to do. So I get there and I go into the waiting room where all the family was. And there were grandparents there. There was his mom, dad, his brothers, cousins, aunts. The other place was full of them. And I, I was so unsure of what to do and what to say that I just went in and I thought, okay, we'll just pray. Jeez, what a, you know, what a revelation. Pray. So we prayed, start, and, and pretty soon everybody's praying in tongues. The nuns, there were nuns, Catholic sisters, speaking in tongues. I'm telling you, it wasn't me. I went to the room, the doctor came in and told us, he was telling the family, there's nothing we can do. He's, he's gone, he's as good as gone. He's on life support, but there's nothing more we can do. They took me up to the room. They thought I was an idiot for even wanting to go up there and pray, but I didn't know what else to do. And I was actually wanting to get away from the family because I knew they were going to be asking me stuff that I couldn't answer. And most of them knew more than I did. They'd been in Pentecost for generations. So I go up to the room, and the doctor, they've already, they, the sheet is over it. He's gone. And I pulled the sheet back, and the doctor looked at me like I was out of my mind. And I put my hand on him and I said, in Jesus' name. And his eyes opened. And he left that hospital two days later with no, no diabetes. With nothing. Now here's what I'm saying. When I tried to do this, I couldn't do anything. When I couldn't do anything, God didn't. And I would go, Sally will tell you, that family, we used to read water meters, their inviter. That was a job she took. I was working for a steel mill hauling scrap iron off the docks and down into the yard, and they'd melt it up and so on and so forth. I was come up from the ship channel in Houston, and they'd haul scrap iron up there, and we'd haul it off in trucks. And they'd unload it and put it in the trucks, and we'd haul it down in the yard. But anyway, she took this job, and so I would help her when I would work a lot of times we'd work 12 hour shifts, 12 on, 12 off, or, you know, it was, just, it was a great paying job. And it was also a job where I could, we'd set a lot waiting on barges to come up or the crane would be down or whatever. We might set for six or eight hours. We was getting paid just sitting in the truck and I would just be there reading the Bible and praying. That's what I did. That's all I did, basically. So we had this job reading water meters and, and uh, this family, I would go, we'd go around, this family was in one of the areas there that we, where we read water meters, and I used to go by there, and the family would call me, and the fact they called me to come and pray with the kid, because he never accepted the Lord, he just got healed. And they wanted me to come and pray with him for him to receive Christ. So I went, and obviously I went over and talked to, the, talked to him, and told him, I said, do you realize what happened? God gave you life, and he gave it to you for a reason, not just so you could have you know, another 50 years to live, but so that you could be born again, mm -hmm. so that you could have eternal life. Well, he never accepted it. And maybe he has since then, but this, and this was, you know, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't, he didn't at the time. Mm -hmm. But he, his grandparents became like parents to me almost. And I'd go to, the, they, they had a trailer there uh, in that little town, and I'd go and They'd invite me over all the time. I'd come over and I'd sit and I would just listen to them. And they would tell me about things that had happened in Pentecost back in the early wow. part of the century. And I would just sit there and suck this all up, just absorb everything that they were telling me because it was like, it was like what I dreamed of. It was what I 
wanted to experience, you know. And uh, we, you know, we, we came close. And so I'm just I'm saying that because when I said that last week, I didn't want to sound like I was defeated. It wasn't that I was defeated, but it wasn't. I was defeated, but God wasn't defeated. I was making it too much about me, what I could do if I put enough into it. And what God was wanting was for me to die. For me to stop and just be the, the means by which he could operate. And when I've been able to do that, he has. It's like the woman at the, in Topeka at the restaurant. We went in there and we were talking to these we were just sitting there listening. I was just eavesdropping on these old women carrying on conversation with each other, <laughs> talking about their family. And, and when we got ready to pay the bill to leave, they were right in front of us. They went out, and we saw this big commotion out there while I'm waiting to pay the check. And a woman comes running in, and she's a nurse. She said, this, this woman just died. She just had an attack, a heart attack, and she's dead. And she's calling the EMs. And the Lord spoke to me. I'm there trying to pay the bill. And the Lord said, go pray for her. And I thought, I argued with him. I said, I, she's dead. He said, go pray for her. And I didn't want to. I'm telling you. I was embarrassed. I was, I'm, I'm just being honest. It was, it, it was, it, so wonder God didn't kill me. I mean, the, but I went out and I, I went over. And I, again, I was just freaked out and. Humiliate. Everybody's looking at me like, you know, what's going on? They're crying. The women that were with her were crying, and the nurse is saying she's gone. And and I just, again, I just put my hand on her forehead and I said, in Jesus' name. That's all I said because I didn't know what else to say anyway. And I just wanted to obey God. I just wanted to do it and then get out of there. And she set up. And her, the nurse said, "We've got an ambulance that's coming." She said, "No, I'm going home." She said, "No, you need to go to the hospital." She said, "No, I'm going home because she had." All of her bodily functions had given her, you know, so she had wet herself and had a bowel movement and all that had taken place, and she was just disgusted and wanted out of there. And she just said, get me to my car and get me home. So her two friends went with her, got in the car, and away they went. We got in the van. We had a little van at the time and got ready to head out of there. And we got in the van, and I'm telling you, it was like, like the band exploded. And Sally and I are both speaking in tongues, and crying. And, just, and I didn't feel any great power. I just felt relief that I was able to get away from the situation. <laughs> but it was God just did it. Now, that's a couple of instances. That I'm, again, I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this because it wasn't me. I, I wouldn't have done it had God not really twisted my arm and said, you, this is you, go do this. And I knew that it was the Lord. I wouldn't have. I did just stood there like everybody else. She, that's a shame. She was just here a moment ago having a good time with her friends, you know. But God was trying to teach me something, and I was really dense. And I still am. But I know that if, I, if I'll just make myself available, he'll do what he does. And that's what I'm trying to find now. And I'm being honest with you. I don't know what that is. I, I, I know that it's God, and I know that he's trying to get something to, through this thick skull into my spirit so that, I can, so that we can do what it is we need to do. And I assume that he's doing the same thing with you. Yes. And it, it, it's crazy. It makes you, you know, I mean, because you know it, but you just don't know where you're go, how to go with it, you know. And that's where grace comes in. If we just keep trusting, if we just keep the faith... It will be revealed. We'll know it, even if we stumble into it. Even if we don't know what we're doing as we do it, it'll just happen because we make ourselves, I'll be there. You know, I'll do it. And that's the thing about, you know, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. Nobody really knows. We're just, Suzanne's willing to take the risk and, and, and Mike and, and, and Tammy. And that's what I'm saying. That's what, uh, that's what God's looking for. Just be available. You don't have to have all the answers. Just just know that I'm there and I'll do it if you'll let me. If you'll just, just let it happen. And you know this. There, I have no plan here. It's about as chaotic. This church is about as chaotic. You see the kids running everywhere and we're, it's all scatterbrained. And, and we've never had any real ritualistic kind of way of doing things because I never knew that what they were. 
But God knows our heart, and that's why you're here. I, I believe that. that. You're not here by accident. These are, you're, you're people that have a hunger for God. Now, you, you've got your issues like, all, like I do, like everybody does, but God knows your heart, and that's why he brings us together. I believe that. And I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, come on. The, we've had plenty of people come and go. Well, I've never twisted anybody's arm or made them feel guilty about leaving or made them feel guilty if they didn't come. I want people that are here because they feel like God's put them here. The same reason I'm here. Because I wasn't really crazy about taking this church initially. But I knew it was God. You know how I knew it was God? Because I was praying. I was selling. I was on the road. I was in sales. And I was in uh, up in northeast Iowa somewhere. I don't even know where. Because I was on the road all the time. And I was in a motel room and I had just transferred all the uh, sales information to the corporate offices, which were up in Michigan. And uh, I kneeled by the bed and I was praying like I did every night because I, I hated the job. I had been offered to take this church when it was over on the south side in a trailer park over there. And I offered to help the guy out that had the church and said, I'll just, you know, preach for you once in a while. And, but, you know, I really don't want to take the church. I don't want to get back into the ministry because I had all kinds of issues with the organization I was with before. And I refused to sign their letter that I would only preach their doctrine and so on and so forth when God was dealing with me about other things. And so I left that organization and left the church and then they wanted me to take it. And I said, ah, I'll help you out, but I really don't want to do this. And I knew Sally didn't need it because we, I was working a full-time job when we were pastor in the other church, and we never had any money because we took whatever money we made that I made while I was working for Eagle Iron at the time, went into the church because the people that were in the church, for the most part, were not, they weren't wealthy by any means, but most of them weren't even church people. They were people that came in who had nothing. And they didn't understand tithing, and they didn't understand that, a lot of things. And uh, anyway, so, so what money I was making was going back into church. And not that Sally didn't want us to do everything we could, but she's a woman. She had a, we had a little girl, and she was trying to keep a family going and pay the house payments and do the stuff that we were supposed to be doing. And so anyway, I told the Lord, I knew he was dealing with me about it, I, but I don't really want to do this. And I said, okay, here's the deal. And this is what I said. This is before God. He knows it. As I was praying, I said, Lord, if you want, if this is you, you're going to have to have her tell me to take the church. And I'm not going to even talk to her about it. She'll tell you I didn't. We never discussed about it or anything else. I come back off the road that Friday, that Friday afternoon or evening, whenever it was. I walked in the house, and her and Allison, Allison was still at home before she was married. I walked in. They were sitting on the couch or doing something in the living room there. I came in and dropped my briefcase and papers and stuff. And without saying a word, I hadn't even said hello yet, she said, I think you're supposed to take that church. Glory. That was the Lord. That's why I'm here. It isn't that there haven't been times when I felt like just, you know, lock the door, drop the keys off of somebody else, and just move on. But I know God had me here for a reason. I haven't seen a great manifestation of what that reason is, although he has blessed us and taken care of us, even with the small numbers of people that we have, the faithfulness and the goodness of the people that are here and, and others, he's kept us and blessed us. But I'm just saying, it's God. And I know that it is, or I wouldn't do it. I, if I felt like he wasn't involved in it, I would have just cashed in and said, somebody else can do this and probably do it better than I do. So I'm just, I'm saying these things. God knows he's not a respecter of persons. And nobody knows me better than me except for God. So he's not doing this because I'm such a wonderful spiritual. And Sally will be happy to amen. It's, it's because he just likes to take the nobodies and show what he can do.
And it's his grace that has kept me in faith. Has it been? I've needed his grace for a lot of other things, believe me. But the main reason he gives us grace is to keep us in faith, to keep us moving in the right direction. So let me get, let me get to this. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. This is the story of the prodigal son, right? And he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come, thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angered, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as your son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. So we're familiar with this story. We talk about it. Tim talks about it a lot, and, and rightfully so, because it does show us the heart of our Father, our Heavenly Father. The older son had complained that though his father had made a feast and had killed this fatted calf for the prodigal son, for this dork that was just off being drunk and, and whoring around and blowing all the money, he'd never given the older son even a young goat that he might make merry with his friends. Now he was there, he was there, he was doing his stuff, he was helping, he was trying to be, you know. But the answer of the father was, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is yours. Mm -hmm. Now I don't think there's a greater revelation of our father's heart mm -hmm. than what that shows us. We usually talk about how the father's heart was revealed in his welcome to the prodigal and what he did for him. But actually, there's an even greater revelation of the father's love in what he said to the older son. Yes. Yes. If we really want a deeper experience, a really spiritual life, we need, on the one hand, to understand clearly what is the spiritual life God wants us to live. And on the other hand, we need to ask whether we're living that life. Mm -hmm. Or if not, what's keeping us from living it completely? And the question divides itself into four categories. First, the high privilege of every child of God. Two, the low experience of too many of the believers. Three, why the, or what's the discrepancy? And four, the way to restore that privilege. In these scriptures, there's, there's two things that, that, that just really describe the privilege that every one of us has as a child of God. First, son, thou art ever with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about is our, it's what Sally's saying every day, how? how if we're focused on him instead of everything else, right? right? And that son thou art ever with me, that implies fellowship yes. with God. Yes. And not only that it is, but it's our portion. Yes. It's what we're supposed to have. It's what we're supposed to be. And second, all that I have is thine. And that means everything God can give his children is already ours. Yes. Thou art ever with me. Just think of it. Over and over he tells us, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm always near you. But just imagine this. And this is what has just been gnawing at me for weeks now. You can live every minute of your life in my presence. And everything that I have is yours. I will withhold nothing good from you. These are the privileges of the child of God, of 
each one of us. So first of all, we have unbroken fellowship with God. Unbroken. Even, even when we screw up, it's unbroken fellowship. Right. Son, thou art ever with me. Think about it, the Old Testament. Enoch walked with God, and he was not. He got so close to God that he left this realm and went right into the spirit realm. And look at Genesis 28, 15. This is God's promise to Jacob. Genesis 28, 15. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Praise the Lord. That was then how about God's promise to Israel through Moses in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 14. And he said, my presence shall go with me, and I'll give you rest. And then verse 16. For there, wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? How, how we know that we found grace in your sight? Is it not that you go with us? So shall we be separated, and thy, I and thy people, what? From all the people that are upon the face of the earth. In other words, from separate from the world. How, how, how do we know that? Because you're with us all the time. Because we're conscious and aware of your presence. The presence of God with Israel was the evidence of their separation from all other people, from the idolaters, from the haters of God, from the antichrist mindset, from the world. How much more in the New Covenant. Look at John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Amen. That's our promise. I heard somebody talking the other day, and they were talking about the Lord the Holy Spirit coming, because this is what you hear a lot of times from people. We're not a motel. We're a home. He came to make his abode in us. That's permanent, a dwelling place. Not just a sleepover. Not just a, you know, tell the following morning when you got to check out. As believers, every one of us have been called to this privilege to live every minute of our lives in fellowship with God. I know that sounds impossible. That's what goes through my mind when I'm praying early in the morning. And God says, my grace is sufficient. It isn't you can't still live your life, but you'll live your life aware that I'm always with you, that I'll never leave you, and that everything that I have is yours. Too many it, it's, it's just there to convict them and convert them to, to be saved, right? But he came to live in us and to reveal God to us. Not to be, come near to us every once in a while, but permanently dwell in us. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because that makes God's presence manifest to us. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is all about. The veil is torn in two. We have access into the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus into the very presence of God. Yes. Look at John chapter 15, verse 26. But when 
the Comforter is come, whom I will send, remember that, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from me, the Father, or excuse me, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Now look at John chapter 13 and verse 20. Whom I send from the Father, right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me. And he that receives me, receives him that sent me. Yes. Yes. I'm sending you the Holy Ghost. What's he saying? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all dwelling within us. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. We can live all day, every day, with the presence resting on us and in us. It's a question of our focus. It's a question of our faith. Wherever we go, in any kind of trouble, son, thou art ever with me. Crap has hit the fan. But, hey, kids, I'm forever with you. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how messed up it is, remember, I'm always with you. I know some people think God just withdraws from them because they screwed up or they did this or they did that. And the truth is, if it seems like God is absent, it's because of our unbelief. Not because of him withdrawing from us. Look, you aren't going to come up with any new sin that is going to... You know, freak God to the point where he's going to leave you. He said, I'm never leaving you or forsaking you. I've already forgiven you of everything you've ever done, will do. Amen? Yep. So if you're feeling like, you know, I'm just such a mess that he's departed from it, you're wrong. It's your focus that's off. It's your faith that has waned, not God. He's consistent. I'm with you always. Praise the Lord. It's unbelief. And then there's all that I have is thine. Imagine. All that God has is yours. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21. Therefore, let no man glory in men. Let no man glory in the world for all things are yours son thou art ever with me and all that I have is yours in Jesus he's given us all things look at verse 23 all things are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God Isn't that the meaning of the promise in John 14, verse 13, 14? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am? No, I'm, I'm looking for uh, John 14. Yeah. It's uh, whatever you ask my Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. He's given us everything in Jesus. We already have it. That's our life in God as he describes it to us. Now here's the contrast. Luke chapter 15, verse 29. Back to the prodigal story. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Why? Because you never asked. What we just read. His, his lack of understanding of his relationship with his father and what his father had for him, what was available to him. He never enjoyed it because he never asked for it. And what? And then he blames his father. 
And that's a lot of believers, church. We all have the promise of unbroken fellowship with God. And all that he has is ours. You know, all of Israel's unbelief was caused by their limiting God. All the problems they had was because they didn't believe. Not because God was not willing, but because they didn't believe that he would. I mean, he gave them water from the rock. He, he made streams in the desert, he said. And, and, they, and what was their response? Well, will God make a table for us out here in the wilderness? <laughs> well, yeah. He wants to. And then the scripture goes on to say in Numbers, I think it is, it says he, they uh, accused God mm -hmm. and limited him because of their unbelief. It wasn't God limiting himself to them. It wasn't God withholding anything from them. It was them limiting him because they wouldn't believe that he was good enough to do these things for them. Now, it's easy to understand the prodigal, his problem, because he just walked away from God. He walked away from the Father. He said, I don't need it. Just give me some stuff, and I'm out of here. I'm going to go party like it's 1999. I don't want to be bothered with God. I don't want to be bothered with all this mess. I'm going to go get drunk and get high and get laid and whatever else. And, but the older, he never left. But he had no idea what was available. So he was in the same boat. He was separated from access to the Father and from everything that the Father had. It sounds idiotic, but the truth is, the one that stayed wasn't any better shape than the one that left. Right. He was doing stuff, but it wasn't gaining him anything because he didn't have any confidence in the goodness of his father. Right. I'm always with you. All I have is yours. A lot of Christians are acting like Israel. Limiting God. It's not that way for me. He doesn't do that for me, right? I mean, that's the mentality. Well, maybe he did it for you, but so-and-so got this, but he doesn't do that for me. He hasn't done it for me. I'm still struggling with this thing. I'm still trying to get this. I'm still trying to have that. Look at Psalms 84, verse 11 and 12. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Look at this. Remember that. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly or walk with him. Yes. Our O oh Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusts in you. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Yes. It's a question of faith. You see, maybe some people think they don't have the same spiritual capacity as others. And I mean, I, I, I tried, that's what I was trying to explain to you initially. Look, I, looked, I, I saw some of the big names in Pentecost. And I thought, ain't going to happen here. But those guys got their stuff together. Those are spiritual people. They get blessed, but not me. No, it's faith. Period. Yeah. First Peter 1, verses 3 through 8. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, abundant, yes. praise the Lord, yes. mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven. That isn't talking about off in space somewhere. It's talking about in the spirit. Yes. And now do we get whatever's in the spirit, we get it by faith. All right, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Yes. 
wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold tastes. That's where we're at, church. Yes. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tied with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Yes. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Romans 5.5. 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. All that I have is thine. Are we conscious of that? But you never gave me a goat. All that I have is yours. I gave it to you in Christ. Matthew 5, verse 45. I remember I talked about God, God himself. He said, I'm the son, the son, and the, so forth. That you may be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to, sh to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, just, so think of God as the sun, how he described himself. It never gets tired of shining, pouring out its light on good and evil. You can close the windows. You can pull the shades. But the sun's still shining. It shines on them anyway. We could be sitting in darkness, but the shining would still be the same. Even when it's cloudy, the sun's shining. Yes. You're just looking at clouds. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of the cloud, the sun's still shining there. Right. Would God who made the sun to shine do less for us? It's a question of focus. Yeah. The experience is a choice. The older son thought he was serving his father faithfully. All those years, I did all the stuff. I did everything I was supposed to do. I worked. I did it. I, 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 and I complained and murmured. But I did. But it was the spirit of bondage. It was the spirit of religion. Not in the spirit of a child, but in the spirit of a slave or a servant. His unbelief blinded him to his father's love. He was simply living in unbelief. Ignorance. Blindness, robbing himself of the privilege that his father had for him. Mm -hmm. right. So if our experience isn't what God wants it to be, it's because our unbelief in God's love, his power, his goodness, and the reality of his promises. Remember the prodigal son and his repentance. Remember? Mm -hmm. He came to himself. Tim talked about. It. He's out there slopping the hogs. He's thinking, you know, I'm hungry. It's starting to look edible. <laughs> but he has a change of mind. He repents. He changes his mind. Mm -hmm. Luke 15, uh, verse 17 and 18. That'll be the last scripture. We'll wrap up here. So he came to himself. He came to the Spirit, right? To the real Him. And he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and spare? And I'm here starving. That was the first step for the prodigal. And it's the first step for any kind of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Unbelief is sin. It's coming short of God's blessings, God's promises. Mm -hmm. Now we've got grace. And grace will give you forgiveness, but it won't get you the promise. That takes faith. Yes. Change your mind about God. Mm -hmm. Believe that everything that he has is already yours. Yes. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Yes. By faith, I'll believe every moment I am in my Father's presence. Every moment, even when I'm thinking stupid, I'm going to remember that I am in my Father's presence. And all that he has is mine, even when it looks like I've got nothing. 
We, the, see, the unsaved or the unconverted, they need conviction, right? They need to be convicted. Or that word just simply means they need to be convinced that God wants to save them. Well, carnally minded Christians or Christians that are operating in the flesh need to be convinced. They need to be convicted or they need to be convinced of God's love and blessings. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. I'm always with you. And all that I have is yours. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Hang around. Suzanne's got uh, some things she wants to do. And I know it's the Lord. So open yourself up to it. And you think, I don't need anything. That we all need it. And if God's wanting to use her and he's speaking to her to get our attention, let's uh, take advantage of it. I'm with you all. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Receive it. In the name of the Lord. I'll be first. <laughs>